So now we're going to turn our attention to Java thread pools. Now that we've talked a little bit about what the executor framework is to kind of provide the high level perspective on the mechanisms that are provided. We've also given a quick overview of what a, a thread pool is in general. And now we're going to start talking specifically about how Java supports the concept of thread pools. And as you'll see, there's a, a bunch of different types of thread pools that Java supports. They have so-called fixed size thread pools. They have so-called cached or variable size thread pools. And they even have something called a work stealing thread pool, which is, is really the coolest of all the different features we have here. The executor framework supports several different types of thread pools out of the box. So when you get Java, you install Java 5 or later, you get a bunch of thread pools without having to do anything else other than learn how to use them. Probably the, the easiest type of thread pool to explain and to use is something called a fixed size thread pool. And as the name suggests, it has pre-allocated a fixed number of threads that are then reused when different requests come in in order to amortize the thread creation costs. And, and all that really means is we, we pre-spawn them and then we don't have to incur the costs of spawning new threads with each new request that comes in. So this is kind of what it looks like. You say executors.new fixed thread pool and you pass in whatever size you want it to be. Let's say it's four, just for sake of argument, because we might have four cores. Uh, and usually the, the usually the size of the thread pool is relatively, uh, it, it's a function of the number of cores in some way or another. And so we pre-allocate this pool. You can see I show a picture of it on the right-hand side of the slide. And then when a request comes in, the request is serviced by calling the execute method on that fixed size thread pool, which is provided through an executor, which is an interface we'll talk about. And there you would give it a runnable of some kind, and that will then queue up the runnable, and then one of the threads in the pool will pull it off the queue and process it till it is finished. So that's essentially the way that things work. If a thread terminates for some reason, for example, if, if a thread has an unhandled exception that ends up uh, causing the thread to go away, then the fixed size thread pool is smart enough to detect that and then it will respawn another thread in order to keep the number of threads in the pool constant. So you can think of it kind of like the, uh, like the Hydra uh, from Greek mythology, where if you cut off a head, another one grows back, or maybe two grow back. <laughs> depends on, on uh, which version of the Hydra myth you're familiar with. But the point is that it, the threads that, that uh, terminate are replaced. So that obviously raises an important question how many threads should be in the fixed size thread pool? Because you get a one shot deal to create the number you need. So if you have only compute bound tasks, a compute bound task is something that will be CPU intensive. It doesn't do any IO. It might briefly block for locks, but basically it spends all of its time doing compute based operations, like doing some algorithm, like sorting or computing whether a number's prime or doing the greatest common divisor computation or, or anything like that, that that's going to be compute intensive. If you have compute bound tasks and you have an N core CPU, then you're really best served by having a fixed size thread pool with N threads in it or roughly N threads in it. Uh, you could have N plus one or N minus one, probably N is the best choice. And the reason why you would choose this is because those computations are never going to block on IO and therefore they won't, you will not benefit by having more threads than there are cores because they're not going to run. <laughs> they're going to have to wait their turn. So um, you're, you're best served by having a pool of threads that is the same number of threads as the number of cores because that's the maximum you can, com you can process for compute bound tasks. And we typically think of these compute bound tasks as what are called run to completion tasks. And that's what that little image means, run to completion. You start processing and you keep going till you're done. There's another kind of task called an IO bound task. And these would be things, for example, like reading and writing to a file, reading and writing to a network connection, like a socket of some kind. And in that case, there actually can be periods where the thread is blocked waiting for the IO to complete. So what you want to be able to do in that case is you want to be able to overlap communication and computation, where communication could be also loading and storing from, 
persistent backup or something that could take a while to run. So if you have I.O. bound tasks on an N core CPU, you're best suited to make the size of the thread pool match the following formula. N, where N is the number of cores, times one plus WT over ST. So what the heck is WT and what the heck is ST? So WT is wait time, and that's the amount of time that, that the system will be waiting for IO to complete. And ST is service time, where that's the amount of time to do the computations once the IO has, has been received, once you've read in a chunk of data or once you've um, read in something from a network and so on. So if you think about this sort of intuitively, if WT is high, in other words, you're spending a lot of time blocking, then relative to ST, the service time, then that number will be larger than one. So what you're doing there is you're saying one plus WT over ST, such that if you're waiting for a long time, you need a larger number of threads in order to get good performance. And that's because when one thread is blocked on IO, if there are other threads in the pool, then those other threads can be taking advantage of the underlying cores while the blocking thread is automatically suspended by the operating system kernel until its IO completes. Conversely, if WT is very short, you're not waiting very long to get the work that you need to do, and ST is large, then that basically drives that value to perhaps below zero, in which case it's one plus zero, <laughs> so it would end up being N threads. And it takes a little bit of time to sort of get your head around this equation, but it's, it really makes a lot of sense intuitively. The more blocking there is, the more threads you need in order to be able to get higher throughput. So just kind of think about that a little bit. That is likely to show up in a, in a quiz question. So make sure you're familiar with what that concept means. The goal of doing this, the goal of having this equation and using this to drive the, the decision about how many threads to have in your pool is to try to keep the cores fully utilized. The whole purpose of thread pools is to maximize utilization. And our goal is to be able to get as much work done in the system as possible. Keep that in mind when we talk about some other ways of doing thread pools besides fixed size thread pools. Now, of course, how do you figure out what WT is? How do you figure out what ST is? That would be crucial here. And probably the most obvious way to do this is to use some kind of profiling mechanism. And there's a bunch of Java profiling mechanisms that are out there that you could use to basically do some simulations or emulations of your program, get a sense of what the average wait time is, the average service time, and then use that to plug into the formula. Obviously, if those values are incorrect or imprecise, you're, you're not going to be successful in figuring in the right number of threads for your pool. And in that case, for example, if you have highly bursty data where there is no clear average that's consistent, you're better off using some of the other threading mechanisms we're about to talk about. Another potential downside with fixed size thread pools is that deadlock can be a problem. And that's because you only have a fixed number of threads. So if you end up with a fixed number of threads that use a bounded queue to queue up work, you could end up having threads blocked and the queue fills up and therefore the system can't make any progress. So if you, if you wanna learn more about that particular challenge, that particular uh, anti-pattern, take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, which explains the situations that induce deadlocks in thread pools with a fixed number of threads and a bounded queue. Okay, so because fixed size thread pools are not perfect for all use cases, there's other kinds of thread pools that Java supports as well. Another very common approach is called a cached thread pool or a variable size thread pool. And what this approach does is it creates new threads on demand as the client workload increases. So let's take a look and see how this might work. So the way you, you make a, a cache thread pool, as you might expect, is by calling a factor method. And the factor method is called new cache thread pool. And that will start out by having a thread pool with zero pre-allocated threads. So there is no initial thread pool that's allocated. We just have the capability to have a thread pool. And then when a request comes in, we call the execute method, giving it a runnable like we did before, except what'll happen here is it'll first check to see, are there any other available threads that were created earlier for earlier requests that are still hanging around and have nothing else to do? And if there is, we'll reuse those threads. So that's the pool part. 
if there are no available threads, it'll create a new one. But when threads are created, they're, they're sticky and they live for a little while. And what'll happen here is they'll live for a minute by default. And after a minute, they'll automatically be terminated. But if during that time, other requests come in and those threads can be reused, then they'll stay alive. So they're only terminated if they're not used for a minute. So if anywhere in between that minute they're used, then they get their, their clock, their uh, expiration time reset, their, their use by date reset. And as a result, they'll stay around. So this is basically a way of dynamically allocating a pool of threads that reflects bursty workload on the part of clients. So the nice thing about this approach is there's no real need to estimate the size of the thread pool in, in advance. You don't have to guess, you don't have to speculate, you don't have to estimate, you just let it do its thing. The downside is you end up having to create new threads, which was kind of the reason why we used the fixed size thread pool in the first place was to amortize that creation. So if you have a lot of bursty threads, you'll create a whole bunch of threads. They will of course eventually go away, but you will end up creating a lot of threads at any given point in time to handle bursty workloads. There's the third type of thread pool. This, this came a little bit later. The, the first two types we talked about, the, the fixed size thread pool and the cache thread pool came out in Java 5 in the 2004 timeframe. This next type of thread pool called the fork join pool came out in Java 7, which came out in 2010. And this is what are called the work stealing queues. We'll talk a lot more about these later. I will not begin to do justice to all the coolness that are work stealing queues. But in a sense, what these queues do is they steal work from, the, you have threads in a pool, each thread has its own queue. It's a special kind of queue called a deck, a double-ended queue. And those threads will process work on their deck. And if they don't have anything in their deck, they will go and steal work from the end of other worker thread decks. And the whole point of this is to try to keep the utilization of the system as high as possible. How do you create such a thing? You just say new work stealing pool, which will create a new work stealing thread pool that defaults to the number of available cores. So if you have eight cores, you'll have eight threads, or if you have four cores, you'll have four threads in the pool. Those are called worker threads. And when requests come in, it, it looks just like the way we did it before, where you call execute and you pass in a request. But the difference here is that the work can be stolen. So the work will end up initially being queued on the deck of the thread where execute is called. And there's a couple other methods we'll talk about later that you can use as well. And if the thread where executes called is busy doing other things, then the work that are queued on that thread's deck will be stolen by other threads in the fork join pool. So this particular approach is cool because it helps to strike a balance between fixed sized and variable sized thread pools. And in fact, there's some really cool features that we'll talk about later in the course called managed blockers, which you can use with the so-called common fork join pool in order to allow the pool to temporarily expand itself and then shrink itself when operations will block. So this is more powerful than the cache thread pool mechanism because it didn't differentiate between blocking and non-blocking computations. But the fork join pool has got some really cool mechanisms in it. So we'll spend a whole, probably a whole week talk, talking about a fork join pool later in the class. So those are the things you get out of the box with Java threads and the Java executor framework. Of course, there's other ways to implement thread pools. There's the half sync, half async model. There's the leader followers model. These are both examples of patterns that are described in, in a book I wrote a long time ago, like 20 years ago. Um, but you're also welcome to take a look at the website links at the bottom of the slide, which will give you information about these kinds of thread pools. One of the cool things about Java's executor framework is if you don't like the thread pools you get out of the box, you can implement your own. You could implement the half sync, half async pattern. You could implement the leader followers pattern and so on. And if, if you like those things better, if they work better for you, you can integrate it seamlessly with the rest of the framework. And we'll take a look at sort of how to do that later. So this is very, very powerful, very customizable. So that's the end of the overview of Java's thread pools. As you can see, there's a lot of interesting things here. And we're actually gonna spend a fair number of weeks in this course going through all those different mechanisms in a lot more detail. And you'll get a chance to apply multiple of them in upcoming programming assignments.